Okay, well, welcome to the uh, EOL seminar for June. Our speaker today is Ron Smith, and I met Ron uh, two years ago down in New Zealand where we were doing the deep wave experiment, which he was a co-PI for. He currently leads Yale's program on mesoscale meteorology and regional climate, uh, which includes atmospheric dynamics, aircraft and satellite-based atmospheric observations, hydrometeorology with water isotopes, and remote, satellite remote sensing of landscape changes and climate sensitivity. And that description of the program pretty much describes his current research areas, research interests. He received his bachelor's in aeronautical engineering from Mensis Layer in Polytechnic, his doctorate from John Hopkins. And then uh, right after that, he came and was a postdoc fellow here at NCAR. Since then, he's uh, had three stints as a visiting scientist. Among the awards, he's received a Fulbright Scholarship. He's a fellow of the American Meteorological Society. He's also the author on about 125 publications, if I counted right, past editor of the AMS Journal of Atmospheric Sciences, and a past member of the UCAR Board of Trustees, and, uh, well, quite a few more. But I'm sure you'd rather listen to him than to me, so I'll turn it over to Vi. Stuart. M mic on? Yep. Well, thanks for the invitation. I was happy to come out here. It's a good time of the summer to, to visit Boulder. Um, I've got a talk within a talk. I want to talk about deep wave data and results, but I want to embed this in a little broader discussion about research aircraft contributions to gravity wave research. I've started, now that I got to the end of this first set of, of uh, deep wave data analysis, I began to think about some broader issues of what aircraft are contributing to the broader field of gravity wave research. So I just want to say a few words about that. So let's start out with some history. And let me just uh, start with this. I wanted to uh, tip my hat to um, some of the early scientists working here at NCAR on the field of gravity waves, including Doug Lilly, Joe Klemp, Terry Clark, Jacques Kuttner, Don Lenshaw, John Gilly, Rolando, and in general, the RAF, which has been involved in supporting flight level or research projects uh, for gravity waves over many, many years, my, my entire career, in fact. So hats off to you guys for that. Um, the paper, the, the field of gravity wave research has gone through a bit of a transition. And I think this paper is a good way to illustrate it. So uh, Doug Lilly, in 1972, published in the Bulletin of the American Meteorological Society a short paper called Wave Momentum Flux, a GARP problem. GARP was an old acronym for the Global Atmospheric Research Program. And um, he, this article, plus other things that were going on at the time, uh, produced a kind of a major change in the way gravity wave research was directed, motivated, and carried out. And I think I can illustrate that with this. So if you look at what was motivating gravity wave research in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, maybe even into the 80s, it was local phenomenology. I know that I was fascinated by the idea of uh, severe downslope winds here in Boulder and other places, clear air turbulence, lenticular clouds, so like many of you perhaps, I got uh, incited about doing time-lapse photography for these clouds. And uh, that was certainly a motivator uh, for me and a number of other people on looking at gravity waves. In addition, uh, the basic atmospheric dynamics of gravity waves, the role that they played in adjusting the atmosphere to neutral buoyancy the role that they played in adjusting the atmosphere into geostrophic balance, and the general um, interesting mathematical and physical problems about how these waves that have a rather complicated dispersion relation uh, could be generated, propagate uh, in the atmosphere, and how to treat that mathematically and numerically. And a number of very good mathematicians, not myself, but uh, got involved in that theoretical problem of how to understand these complicated dispersive waves in the atmosphere. And that was all well and good, but that kept the community pretty small. And it was Doug Lilly's letter and others that began to show how to take that basic knowledge and apply it to a series of climate problems. 
And that's what's happened over the last 20 years, that uh, the study of gravity waves has broadened, deepened, and accelerated at an amazing rate. Now there are about as many papers published on gravity waves as there are on clouds, believe it or not. And, um, and the number of scientists involved in this around the world is certainly up in the hundreds. So it's quite a big active area of meteorology research now because of the role of gravity waves on jet streams, polar vortex, meridional circulations, QBOs, SEOs, a lot of other acronyms get involved in gravity wave research. A couple of examples. The brewer drops in circulation in the stratosphere and this pole-to-pole -pole middle atmosphere circulation are believed to be driven partly or mostly by gravity waves. And in the tropics, things like the semi-annual oscillation and the quasi-biennial oscillation is also driven in part, uh, in some cases, some people believe mostly, by gravity waves. So this has really expanded the scope of the field of gravity wave research. Very exciting hot area right now. Um, to catch up on this, uh, the application of gravity wave research to climate and general circulation problems, I recommend these three review papers. Uh, and there's, of course, many more out there, but this will just give you an example of what's happening to the field today. Lots of people working on these problems and, and lots of uh, advances. Some of the questions they're addressing are gravity wave generation mechanisms. They're mostly thought to be orographic, convective, or due to jet stream imbalances. How to measure global gravity wave statistics. Most of that has to be done by satellites. The relative importance of different types of waves, gravity waves versus planetary waves versus Kelvin waves, and what are the dominant scales of these waves? And are they measurable by different types of observational methodologies? How gravity waves propagate, how they leak through uh, layers that are not well stratified, how they refract, how they attenuate, how they break down, how they deposit their momentum, and how the circulation of the atmosphere responds to those momentum inputs. These are the topics that you hear about today when you go to AGU or other meetings on gravity waves. How do we measure these? Um, well, there's lots of ways, and um, balloon soundings are a well-used method, but they only give you data along a line, and they don't give you the full set of scale information. You don't get much information about horizontal scales. Constant density balloons are making a big push right now to become one of the dominant uh, methodologies for measuring balloon, uh, for measuring gravity waves because they can give you, as they drift around and around the globe, they give you substantial area coverage, which is something we really need. The main uh, method for getting global coverage, though, is passive satellite sensors, both nadir and limb looking. And um, there's a huge activity in that area right now. But as I'll mention near the end of my talk, there are some fundamental limitations to that that probably cannot be overcome in the near future. Passive ground-based systems, but often they're clouded, they're, they're covered by, they're screened by clouds, and they only give you local measurements anyway. And uh, LIDAR measurements are also usually local. They don't give you the wavelength information that you need in the horizontal. And the VHF Doppler radars are also a lot of recent papers on this. But they're very local, uh, and they don't give you the kind of coverage that you need. Now, most of the talk is going to be about research aircraft, so I just put that bold. But I'll be spending most of the day talking about that. Um, very quick review on where we've come with airborne gravity wave research. Started out 60 years ago, 70 years ago, uh, with just a, uh, a barometer or a barograph in a glider or a variometer measuring vertical velocity by how the glider goes up and down. Then came isentropic analysis where you could map a region back and forth with an aircraft, draw contour lines of constant potential temperature and work out the gravity wave fields that way. 
Then the gust probe and inertial platform came along, allowed you to do vertical and horizontal winds. Let's just review those very briefly, because most of my talk is about these today. So um, that's what a variometer looks like in a glider. It gives you vertical speed. And there's an old paper by Jacques Kuttner from 1939, where he kept track of vertical motion in his glider just by seeing how the aircraft was pushed up and down by the updrafts and downdrafts. And that's something that Kuttner and Doug did together uh, back in the late 60s, mapping out isentropes over the front range. Again, just using the idea of theta as a tracer. Then we got into gust probes and inertial platforms, and that was a huge step forward, because now we could measure momentum fluxes, U prime, W prime, and that's one of the first diagrams to be published showing vertical profiles of momentum flux in, in gravity waves. So that really was a major, a major influence. Now, let's get to the heart of the talk with that little historical introduction. I want to talk about the Deep Wave project, which took place in um, 2014 down in New Zealand. A uh, cast of thousands, I can't go through all the names, but many of you were involved in this, so you know, I won't have to give that kind of view. You know what it was like to be down there. The basic objective was to see how gravity waves would penetrate, uh, we say deep, we mean high, into the atmosphere. Most of them generated in the troposphere, propagating, perhaps they'll make it through the stratosphere, perhaps they'll make it through the mesosphere, perhaps they'll get up into the up into the lower thermosphere. That was the basic idea. And what was remarkable about that is that you go through five orders of magnitude of decrease in air density over that kind of range. And according to basic gravity wave uh, theory, when waves propagate into a layer of the atmosphere that has a lower density to conserve its energy propagation, it's got to amplify. It amplifies like the inverse square root of the density. So this would... Uh, convert to a several hundred fold magnification in wave amplitude if the wave were able to penetrate that deeply into the atmosphere. So even waves that might be uh, immeasurably small in the troposphere might become quite large and important up in the middle, in the middle atmosphere. Where to do this? Uh, in order to get gravity waves to propagate deeply, you've got to have westerlies that extend all the way to those altitudes. You find those regions by going to the winter hemisphere and high latitudes, uh, north or south. It's a little better in the south. And so here is a climatology derived from satellites of temperature variance in the southern hemisphere winter at the 10 hectopascal level, showing these hot spots of temperature variance, that is to say, gravity wave activity. Of course, some of you know the story. We wanted to do our project there, tried hard to make that happen, couldn't work out the logistics of that, ended up doing it in New Zealand. And it, too, has a nice gravity wave bullseye. And so that turned out to be um, a very nice place to do, to do the deep wave project. Now, what did we have for the project? We had the uh, G5 and the DLR Falcon. And uh, these arrows are meant to represent the various sensor systems that are deployed on the G5. Of course, we had drop sons. We had the microwave temperature profiler looking up and down. We had a passive sensor looking at downwelling information uh, from the air glow layer up at 87 kilometers. And we had a couple of LIDARs sending a signal up and returning signals back to the aircraft. So uh, it was quite a nice system for looking at the vertical profile of this gravity wave propagation. Here's another way to look at that. Here's a cross section through New Zealand, west to east. Uh, and uh, let's say the aircraft is flying at that level. It's dropping sons. Those are the blue lines. It's uh, sending. Um, LiDAR beams up and looking at backscatter. It's also got passive sensors looking at the air glow emissions coming back down. And then the island is also instrumented. It's got upsons, and it's got uh, active and passive remote sensing systems. So again, the idea is to follow these waves from uh, top to bottom and try to understand their deep, uh, 
their deep propagation. For example, um, Utah State, Mike Taylor and, and Dominique Pate had a device called the Advanced Mesospheric Temperature Mapper that could look at um, uh, passive emissions from the air glow layer and map that out as we flew under. All you need to do is get above the clouds. And that's what we did. All of our flights were above the clouds. And so unlike these instruments which have been installed at the surface of the Earth, we always had clear viewing as we looked up. And that was important. Of course, this means we always had to fly at night because these emissions are so weak that you can't see them if the sun is shining. So all the flights in deep wave were done at night. Typically, we'd take off an hour or so after sunset, get back a few hours before sunrise, and instruments like this would work beautifully, as well as the LIDARs. We had a sodium and a Rayleigh LIDAR on board the aircraft. Uh, this was put together by Dave Fritz and Biff Williams. Um, this shows some backscatter from the Rayleigh LIDAR compared with um, temperature perturbations derived direct, directly from the ECMWF forecasts that shows you that some of these longer wavelength waves, wavelengths of two and 300 kilometers, um, inertial gravity waves, are actually pretty well represented in today's forecast models already. And now we can see them by an up-looking uh, Rayleigh LiDAR. At the top of the diagram, you see some data from the sodium LiDAR, giving you the density of sodium ions and they also seem, to some extent, to line up with the predicted large-scale vertical motions from the ECMW forecast. So this is quite a breakthrough to be able to detect and verify that these disturbances you see at the two to 300 kilometer range are actually uh, real in the atmosphere. But now for the rest of the talk, I'm going to talk just about flight level data. Although remote sensing was a very important part of deep wave, I want to focus now on the flight level data, a more traditional way of using aircraft to measure gravity waves. So um, there we were for a couple of months in southern hemisphere winter. Most of these flights were done at about 12 kilometers. A total of 26 flights, 180 flight hours. Of those, um, 49 flight hours were over New Zealand proper comprising 97 legs back and forth across the island, and 84 hours were flown out over the ocean, either the Tasman Sea or the Southern Ocean, comprising 157 legs. A typical leg length was about 350 kilometers. And we, uh, in the data analysis, we worked hard to improve the accuracy of flux estimation from these legs. And I'm going to talk about that at some length in just a minute. Those are the deep wave legs that we did over the Tasman Sea and the Southern Ocean. And then zooming in to New Zealand, those are the legs that we did over the island itself. Uh, they all went over either Mount Cook or Mount Aspiring. And in addition, we had balloon launches from Lauder, from Haast, and from Hokitika to um, supplement the data set. Here's a typical um, sounding from those three sites, Hokitika, Haast, and Lauder, during one of the aircraft missions. And it shows, uh, so the aircraft is flying about there. So it shows that we're in the very low troposphere. Um, pretty simple temperature profiles, a bit of a uh, tropopause inversion layer here, which has been talked about in the literature. The wind speed profiles, of course, are very noisy because these atmospheres are loaded with vertically propagating gravity waves. So they're causing a lot of distortion in what would otherwise, I suppose, be a rather simple um, wind speed profile. Here's two different cases, Research Flight 12, Research Flight 16, and there's roughly the altitude where the G5 did most of its flying. This is typically what you'd find. These are two flights, two missions over over Mount Aspiring, there's the terrain that's been elevated up into this diagram. And shown here are seven legs from Research Flight 4, where I've computed the vertical displacement of air parcels using that formula. Basically, you combine vertical motion and horizontal motion as measured with the gust probe system. 
you can integrate that from a starting point and come up with an estimate of what an air parcel would do as it flies over the mountain. Basically, you see pretty smooth upstream conditions, but then a lot of wiggles. Basically, the air is going up and down by about 500 meters up and down as it flies, as it passes over the mountain range. And um, we'll, we'll, we'll be looking into that in much more detail, but that's a starting point. Basically, the air is going up and down by about plus or minus 500 meters as it passes over those mountains. We're going to compute all of these fluxes for these legs. Um, the zonal and meridional components of the vertical flux of horizontal momentum, the vertical energy flux, two components of the horizontal energy flux, and a quantity I'm calling EFZM. It's a vertical energy flux computed without measuring pressure. According to Elias and Palm 1960, there is a relationship between this quantity and the momentum fluxes shown here. So if we can measure these, multiply them by the two components of the mean wind speed, we should have another estimate for this. According to Elias and Palm, assuming linear waves, steady state waves, uh, and non-breaking, non-dissipative waves. Now, a word about how we're going to use pressure. Um, pressure is relatively new in aircraft studies of mountain waves. We did it first in the T-Rex project uh, five or six years ago, but we tried to do it better this time around. Here's what you do. You measure static pressure off a port on the side of the fuselage. You correct it for fuselage airflow distortion that would change that pressure away from what it would be in the undisturbed environment. We use the Omnistar differential GPS system to get the altitude of the aircraft with an accuracy, something like this, which allows us then to correct for the aircraft altitude, do a simple hydrostatic correction to get the pressure corrected for that. And then for the first time, this time in this project, we also did a further correction to remove um, pressure gradients that are caused by cross-track winds. So if you're flying along and the mean wind is a cross-track, then there's going to be a component of the geostrophic pressure gradient along the line. And you need to correct for that as well. And we've done that in this project. Then you've got your corrected P prime. And then using the uh, perturbation U, V, and W, you can compute those horizontal and vertical energy fluxes. And we did that, I think, uh, we did it better this time than we, than we did in, uh, in T-Rex a few years ago. Um, just to justify that last step, here is the observed pressure gradient compared with the computed pressure gradient using the cross-track wind. So you put the cross-track wind into that formula, you compute the local value of the Coriolis parameter, integrate along the flight track, you get a prediction for how the pressure will change, and that gives a pretty good agreement. And so we know that we can be safe just by subtracting out that gradient when we're looking at gravity waves, because gravity waves are an ageostrophic phenomena. So we don't want to include that pressure gradient into the wave dynamic part of the calculation. So let's get to the results. What's plotted here for all deep wave legs, what were they, 250, something like that, the vertical energy flux, each point is a leg, versus distance from Mount Cook to the center of that particular leg. This is a shorthand way of reminding ourselves which legs were over the mountains and which ones were out over the sea. So if the distance from Mount Cook is any more than about 300 kilometers, you're certainly out over the ocean somewhere. And generally, you find very few, very weak, maybe not even exceeding our detection threshold, a vertical energy flux for those waves. A few of these outliers, like that one, for example, was over Tasmania. So while we were far from Mount Cook, there was another mountain range that gave us a little bit of vertical propagation. That's an outlier. I've worried about that one. I went back to look at it. It turned out to be a very short run, a very short leg, only about 100 kilometers. And it could not be used to really accurately determine energy flux. All the large energy flux values are then um, 
over the over the mountain itself. Of course, this is what we expected. I mean, you expect to get these disturbances over the mountains and not over the sea. Some people would have argued differently than that, but that's kind of what I expected, and that's what we found. Um, and the largest value we found on any leg was 22 watts per square meter of mechanical energy fluxing upwards in the atmosphere. Um, okay, so by the way, stop me if you have questions on any of this. I'd be happy to slow down for a minute. Um, we're going to spend most of the rest of the talk uh, focusing on these on these mountain waves and uh, see what some of their properties are. So these are the 14 New Zealand flights that were actually over the mountains of, of, of New Zealand. And for each one, and for each leg within each of those missions, you've got the vertical energy flux in the same units. There's the maximum one that I pointed out before. So each flight has a variable amount of, of gravity wave activity. The fact that they're all positive means that these are all upwards propagating waves. Occasionally in previous projects, we found once in a while a down propagating wave, maybe some kind of secondary generation occurring up in the stratosphere. In this project, almost everything was upwards, which meant, as you would expect, the mountains are producing them, and these waves are just propagating their energy um, upwards. But notice within each flight, there's also a lot of variability. And I'll, I'll come back to that. So this is the energy flux. Now let's look at the zonal momentum flux. We expect it to be negative for mountain waves because it's bringing momentum down from the upper atmosphere down to the lower boundary. And indeed, they are all negative, as you would expect. And except for turning it around, that pattern looks a lot like the previous diagram. So let's put them together and check out this Elias and Palm prediction. So. What's on the x-axis is the directly measured vertical energy flux, P prime, W prime. And here is that EFZM. In other words, the energy flux estimated from the momentum flux. And they should be equal. And indeed, they're pretty good. The, uh, the slope of the regression line is 0 0.96. And the R squared value is pretty high. This provides, for me at least, um, some evidence that we're doing things right. We're measuring things well enough to show this ideal relationship between momentum flux and energy flux among these gravity waves in the atmosphere. Uh, one can also compute horizontal energy fluxes. These waves are propagating horizontally through the atmosphere as well. Pressure oscillating with velocity propagating the energy through the fluid. For a standing mountain wave that's propagating vertically in Earth coordinates, it must propagate rapidly upstream to balance the advection of that wave energy downstream. So an important characteristic of mountain waves is a strong horizontal propagation. And indeed, we're finding that. So the origin for this diagram is over here. The zonal momentum flux, zonal energy flux is here and the meridional energy flux is there. So each point here, you can think of as a vector coming from the origin to that point, pointing in the direction that the wave is trying to propagate through the fluid using pressure, vo pressure velocity correlations. And indeed, uh, almost all these energy fluxes are towards the west and the northwest, and almost every flight that we did had ambient wind coming in the opposite direction. So while this doesn't prove it quantitatively, this tells you in general these waves are trying hard to propagate upwind against these waves. And again, that's an important and well-known characteristic of steady mountain waves. Um, on occasion, we never found wave breaking at 12 kilometers, but on occasion, uh, we thought we might get wave breaking higher up. We got the aircraft up to 13 kilometers, and on five occasions, we found wave breaking there. And I'm going to show you one of those. In general, the characteristic of wave breaking, as seen in these flights, was ambient flow deceleration. The ambient wind is brought nearly to, nearly to rest, steeply rising isentropes, high frequency turbulence, and uh, very small values of energy flux and reverse, that is to say, positive values of turbulent momentum flux. 
Here's an example from Research Flight 9, Leg 9, up at 13.2 kilometers. There's the vertical velocity measured along the flight track. Distance is down here, and uh, Mount Cook is right there at zero. And uh, you see the burst in turbulence, and you see the strong cooling trend, which means the air is ascending right there. You see that the zonal wind has been brought nearly to rest at that point, and you see these rapid fluctuations in pressure, strong pressure fluctuations within this turbulence. Look at the, on, on this uh, diagram is shown the accumulated vertical energy flux. You start at zero and just integrate that value along the flight track to see where the contributions are coming along the flight track to get the net vertical energy flux for that leg. And look here in the turbulence, lots of P prime, lots of W prime, but no vertical energy flux. And that was expected too, because turbulence is not normally expected to propagate its energy. It normally gets its energy, if it's gonna move it around at all, it does it by entrainment or by advection, but not by propagation. And so it's, but then as soon as you get out of the turbulence and into the waves again, then this accumulated value begins to increase because these waves are definitely propagating mechanical energy upwards. Uh, a couple of mysteries, let's see how am I doing for time? Okay, good. A couple of mysteries um, that we're still working on. One is that during some of these uh, missions, we had rapid changes in these flux values. You saw it in the earlier diagram. I'll give you a, an extreme example in just a minute. And then, uh, when the uh, fluxes were particularly strong, it's not because the waves had a greater amplitude, it's because they had a shorter wavelength. And I'm calling that scale downshifting. Again, it's a mystery, we haven't worked out what's going on there. But here's an example from RF-16. Um, there's the first pass across the mountain, leg one. We got very large values for energy flux. In fact, you've seen that 22 before. That's the largest flux in the whole project, right? That's our primary estimation. Using a secondary sensor on the aircraft, we have another estimate of that. And then using the momentum flux, and using that to compute energy flux, we have a third estimate. So we've got some idea of what our uncertainty is for this as well. We came back about 50 minutes later, and the flux had decreased. We came back another 50 minutes later, it decreased again, and then it had vanished altogether. So within about a three hour period, we went from the largest flux in the project to zero, according to all three estimates. So we don't know what's going on here, but that, there's some rapid fluctuations that are occurring in the wave generation process. And this is uh, high on our agenda for things to understand going forward. And then what about the scale of these waves? Now, these are curious diagrams. Research flight number, you've seen that before on this axis. EFZ computed using a low pass filter. That is, what do the long waves contribute to the vertical energy flux? And then what do the shorter waves contribute? to the vertical energy flux. And my cutoff is roughly at 60 kilometers. So waves with wavelength longer than 60 kilometers are here. And generally, they contribute most of the wave energy if you summed over the whole project. Um, but occasionally, like there and there and there, um, the short waves take over. And look at the scales. These have very different scales. Right? This goes to 20. That goes to 4. So when you get these short waves taking over, they swamp the long waves. Right? So on certain occasions, the largest energy fluxes are associated with a sudden shrinkage in the dominant wavelength of these waves. Again, this is a project we're working on to figure out the physics of this. I'll give you a little more illustration of this. This is a typical wavelet diagram for the zonal momentum flux, distance along the flight track is given here, and wavelength is given there. This is momentum flux, so we should expect values to be negative. So I want you to focus your attention here in these darker blue and paler blue areas. But summing up from left to right, you get this kind of a wavelength spectrum on the right-hand diagram. So the two diagrams are connected in a certain way 
redundant to each other. But you can see here the dominant contributors are at wavelengths of, say, uh, 70 and even 150 kilometers. And that was a typical kind of dominant wavelength throughout the mission. Wavelengths of, I, I've written here, 80, 80 to 200 kilometers. But then on these strong days, it looks like this, a very well-defined maximum right at 20 kilometers, carrying much larger total fluxes than in the last diagram. And one more like this, another um, RF-16 leg one, this is the biggest one of the whole project, that's got a dominant wavelength of about 30 kilometers, very well defined, almost monochromatic. And that the largest flux of the project. So something very strange going on here with this, I'm calling it scale downshifting. The largest waves suddenly have shorter wavelengths. So conclusions from this part, and then I'll wrap up with one last section for this talk. Uh, conclusions directly from the Gulfstream 5 flight level data. Only small fluxes were found over the sea at 12 kilometers, close to our detection threshold. Over the mountains, however, we found positive vertical energy flux, negative zonal momentum flux, the Ellis and Palm relationship was satisfied, and strong upstream energy flux, as you would expect for mountain waves, and the largest values found in each case are given here. We found wave breaking at 13 kilometers and above in a layer we're starting to call the valve layer, and I'll tell you more about that in just a minute. We found rapid transients in wave flux and scale downshifting in strong events. I've got two potential theories, by the way, for what causes these transients and the downshifting. One is, that, you know, New Zealand has very rugged topography. I think that one idea is that some of the time the air flows smoothly over that terrain. Other times it may flow in and out of the valleys. When it flows in and out of the valleys, you get more momentum flux, more energy flux, and a shorter dominant wavelength. The other possibility is, um, and this goes back a ways too, you could suddenly shift into a, like a, like a boulder Chinook, a very severe downslope windstorm, suddenly forming, then dissipating, causing a shortening of the dominant wavelength and a magnification of the fluxes. So we're going to be looking at both of those possibilities as we go forward. Um, and I want to point out that in this project, we've illustrated many of the strengths of aircraft measuring gravity waves. Long duration flights, long range flights, high altitude, we're able with proper forecasting, we're able to get the aircraft into the right location at the right time. We measure lots of different variables and we do it quickly. So you can almost use the frozen, used to be called frozen turbulence, I'll call it frozen wave approximation, where you fly through so quickly, you're almost getting a snapshot of the wave, and there's a certain advantage to that. We're getting more accurate flux measurements now. We're also, we've demonstrated we can do good remote sensing off late aircraft as well, especially because we're above the clouds. Um, we can do rapid repeat measurements just by reversing course and go back through the waves again. We can select our altitude. We can go up and find that wave breaking if we have to. And we get a very wide range, a very wide dynamic range of measurements in the G5 with the gust probe. Scales as small as 10 meters up to 400 kilometers, almost a range of 10 to the fifth in the range of scales. No other measurement system gives you that kind of broad dynamic range. The big problem, of course, you get the leg data only, and that is certainly not representative of the full complex gravity wave field that's existing. So that's the big drawback to gravity waves, to aircraft measurements, but these are all of the tremendous advantages. To go beyond that then, one can try to use numerical modeling. So the rest of the talk is going to be giving a few numerical results uh, from deep wave. We do two different types of calculations, two kilometer and six kilometer grid calculations, 150 vertical levers. Levels we go up to 80 pascals. Uh, the coarsest vertical interval in that grid system is 500 meters. We use a a damping layer at the top. We get the boundary conditions 
from the ECMWF analysis, and we've worked very hard to validate these model results against the uh, data from the Deep Wave project, as I'm about to show you. Um, so uh, the six kilometer runs are done on this box, the two kilometer runs are nested in, and when I show you average quantities, they'll be averaged over that box, and when I show you leg quantities, they'll be averaged over a leg like that. And uh, this shows that we did one long run at six kilometers for the entire duration of the project, and then five event runs at higher resolution, trying to capture more of the details of the gravity waves in the, in the wharf model. So what's shown here is um, aircraft observed mean zonal wind along a leg compared with the wharf prediction for mean winds along that same leg. So these are leg average winds over the entire project. Black is from the, the Gulf Stream 5, red is from the DLR Falcon, and this includes a variety of synoptic events. Each point here is a leg over New Zealand for the entire duration of the project. Very good agreement. There's the zonal wind, there's the meridional wind, there's the temperature, and those are for the long runs. We also did that kind of simulation, that kind of comparison for the short runs as well, and the, um, and the agreement is just as good. In other words, we're able to ingest the global model, run the wharf model, and retain the ability to capture the mean conditions over the island very well. Whether it gets the waves is another question. I'll turn to that in a moment. But we get a very good representation of the mean conditions over the island. We also did it with balloon soundings from the three sites, Haast, Lauder, and Hokitika. I won't go through this in great detail, but here's the mean error in zonal wind averaged over many different launches over a two-month period. And a typical mean error is less than a meter per second horizontal error. A mean absolute error is about two meters per second. Well, two in the lower atmosphere, maybe only one meter per second error in the upper atmosphere. So again, we're doing pretty well on predicting the mean quantities over the island using ECMWF boundary conditions to drive a local wharf um, mesoscale model. And here's another way of verifying that we've got the modeling done correctly. A satellite, uh, the Aqua satellite has the AIRS instrument on it, looks down and can measure um, temperature perturbations at various altitudes and detect whether there are gravity waves present. We use the channel that has a peak at around uh, 25 kilometers. That's the instrument function for the channel whose data I'm showing you. There's the wharf prediction of what the temperature variance will be for the entire duration of the project. And there's the variance coming from the AIRS instrument. For the most part, there's a, well, the AIRS instrument has kind of a noise floor that we can't get rid of. But for the most part, it doesn't show waves reaching that altitude very often. But it does here and here. And those are the very same, the same two days when Wharf predicted the waves would be able to penetrate up to those higher altitudes as well. So it does seem the wharf has some skill in predicting when these waves can propagate through and when they cannot. And we're gonna talk about the physics of this starting uh, in just a minute. Here is the one problem. So when you go leg by leg on these fluxes, the agreement is not so good. You've seen this kind of a diagram before for the zonal momentum fluxes. The data is in black for the different G5 flights. The different wharf predictions are shown in color. Basically, they capture it, um, but there's a lot of variability in both, and when you put them on a scatter diagram, one against the other, that's a leg-by-leg -leg comparison of aircraft momentum flux versus the six-kilometer model forecast. There's quite a bit of scatter. The slope's about 0.7. The R value is about 0.5. And when you do the same thing with the two-kilometer, it's not much better. In fact, it may be even a little bit worse. So we get the mean fluxes okay. You can see that here. But on the leg-by-leg -leg fluxes, 
We're not getting it. Probably it's because there's some kind of rapid fluctuation that's going on, as I showed you earlier. And the model's not getting that kind of instability in the wave generation process. Something is going on at high frequency we're not capturing in the model. Here's the full long run momentum, uh, vertical energy fluxes plotted from the model, the six kilometer model for the entire project. This diagram helps you to see when the waves propagate to high altitudes and when they don't. So there's three curves on here. The energy flux reaching four kilometers, 12 kilometers, which is where the aircraft is, and 30 kilometers, which is higher up in the, in the stratosphere. And um, let me just point your attention to two events. RF4, we're calling that a deep event. You have to look carefully to see why we call it a deep event, though. It's not a very strong event, but a little bit of it, the blue curve, does get to 30 kilometers. So that's a, quote, deep event. Look at RF9. It's a much stronger event. But look, absolutely none makes it up to 30 kilometers. So that's our definition of a shallow event. What's going on here? Here's a little... Um, three-dimensional cartoon of what the WARF model is predicting for these two events. There's RF4, which is the deep event. What's shown here, by the way, is an isosurface of the vertical energy flux. So we've got a full 3D field of vertical energy flux. We choose a value to make an isosurface on that, and it shows basically the waves being generated by the island of New Zealand and propagating up at least to 40 kilometers. That's our deep event. We're looking from the, yeah, because there's the North Island and there's the South Island, right, looking from the east. Um, so the winds are actually coming in from the backside on this, right? And there's the shallow event. The wave only gets up to about 17, 18, 19 kilometers, and then that energy is dissipated and is lost. What's going on there is that there's a valve layer. There's a little decrease in wind above the jet stream when the wind decreases, it's not a critical level. It's not the wind goes to zero. It just decreases again before it starts to increase and go on up into the polar night jet. But it's enough of a decrease to make those waves begin to become nonlinear and steepen a little bit. And once they do that, then they're sensitive to breakdown. Turbulence will then dissipate them. So we're now talking about this valve layer as the reason, as the control of whether the waves propagate deeply or not. Um, this is a pretty common uh, climatological feature in the mid-latitudes. Here, for the winter of 2014 in the southern hemisphere, are the zonally averaged winds in the contours. And you see if the subtropical jet is here, there is this region right in here where the wind increases to the jet stream, then decreases again before increasing up into the polar night jet. So this whole region is the so-called valve layer. You don't find it at very high latitudes. At low latitudes, you tend to find more of a critical lever, level, but in mid latitudes, you tend to find this valve layer. We call it a valve layer because that's where the control is. When you open and close your faucet, you're letting the water go through or not, and what's happening here is that the wind speed at that level is controlling nonlinearity and thereby controlling the ability of the waves to propagate up through that level. So um, let's look at how this works quantitatively. Here's a, uh, a time axis, the entire deep wave project, and a height axis here for, for the mean winds. Average U, average zonal wind, given in color. Um, so weaker winds near the surface, the, the subtropical jet is here, and then weaker winds aloft, not all the time. There's an exception where you did not get a weaker wind in the valve layer. And if you average all this together, by the way, you, so, you see slow winds, the jet stream, the valve layer, and then stronger winds aloft. Here's the um, model-derived momentum flux. It should be negative. It is most of the time. The yellow... Uh, are positive, but that's when the wind is reversed and you're getting easterlies, which is rare, so you can ignore those for now. But generally, the momentum flux gets up to about 
15 to 20 kilometers and then ends. Here's the one case where it goes deep, and that was the one case where you didn't have the weak winds at that level, right? So it's the winds that are controlling whether those waves get up into the middle stratosphere or not. And um, this is the vertical divergence of the momentum flux. In other words, this is what's called the gravity wave drag. It's the vertical divergence of the, of the momentum flux. It's given here in units of meters per second per day. Think of it as a deceleration of the flow as the gravity waves deposit negative momentum in that layer. And occasionally it goes deeply, but most of the time that is located right in the so-called valve layer. And you see it here summed up. The largest, on average, decelerations are right in this 15 to 20 kilometer range. That's the valve layer, and that's where very often the waves break down and don't, aren't able to penetrate further. So we looked at all the, um, the entire long run and plotted the momentum flux reaching 25 kilometers as a function of the minimum wind speed in the valve layer, and this is the result. So this is the minimum wind speed in the valve layer, units of meters per second. 30 meters per second means there's not much of a valve layer. The wind is blowing pretty strongly up there. Weak winds are going to really make those waves nonlinear and break. There's a pretty good relationship, right? Strong winds, you can get momentum flux profiles going on deep up into the up into the stratosphere. So that valve layer is controlling things. We can look at a couple of other quantities to understand that a little bit more deeply. The aerial potential vorticity is conserved in smooth gravity waves, even in nonlinear gravity waves. As long as they don't break down to turbulence, you get the conservation law that uh, prevents any generation of potential vorticity within a finite amplitude gravity wave. But if it breaks down to turbulence, then the turbulent heat and momentum fluxes can cause the potential vorticity to change. This can cause things like PV banners, which is a local generation of PV, which then gets evicted downstream by the mean flow. And I'm going to show you that, I think, in the next uh, one after this. So I'm going to show you uh, an event simulation for RF9, a two kilometer simulation. Um, there was a well defined jet and a well defined valve layer for that event. The zonal gravity wave drag had a well defined peak at about 17, 16 kilometers. Um, and there was a large potential vorticity variance right at that same level. We're claiming that that potential vorticity came as a result of the gravity wave dissipation and breakdown at those levels. I'm going to put this into motion now. Here is the PV field at 10 kilometers in the jet, where there's not much PV generation. And here's the PV at 15 kilometers in the valve layer, where there's wave breakdown, momentum deposition, and potential vorticity generation. Potential vorticity is generated in these wave breakdown regions, and then it gets affected, advected away as positive and negative potential vorticity banners at that level. So it's a good way to visualize the role of that momentum deposition at that one particular layer in the atmosphere. If you slice down through that, that atmosphere, um, this is east-west and Z is going upwards. What's plotted here is the um, potential vorticity variance um, as well as, I believe, the, turb the, um, the minimum Richardson number. So zero is Mount Cook? Zero is Mount Cook. It's down below the diagram because we start at 12 kilometers. But Mount Cook is right down below there. And you see the wave breaking is occurring in three regions. This has been known. Other models from other projects have shown this. This is the level I was showing the PV generation at. But there's a little bit below that, and that's where the aircraft, you remember that diagram I showed you about a half an hour ago of the aircraft penetrating through the wave break region? That was this case. We didn't find any turbulence at 12 kilometers, but at 13 kilometers, we did. So what we did was fly through this little guy, right? the bottom end of this. Most of the action is there, a little bit higher, but we did get to see what was happening in that event. We got the aircraft to penetrate through that. 
through that event. The last thing I want to do, since we're now able to compute these gravity wave drags from the well-verified, we're calling it the, quote, well-verified WARF numerical model, let's compare that with what the global models are predicting for gravity wave drag using one of the standard gravity wave drag parameterizations. This is a well-developed field. So on the top, you've got our calculations for the entire project of gravity wave drag from the long run. And you see the strong, uh, the frequent strong gravity wave drag being applied to the valve layer. And down below is what the MERA gravity wave drag, MERA is a NASA GCM that has its own built-in parameterization scheme. Where is it predicting the gravity wave drag to be? It's actually pretty good. It gets the pattern pretty well. I was impressed when I first saw how well those patterns compare with another. But unfortunately, the values are quite off. The scale is a factor of four different. So we're, we're computing about four times the amount of gravity wave drag as is being put in to the MERA model using the existing gravity wave parameterizations. So we think they ought to take a look, a new look at their gravity wave parameterizations and see what they should do about that. We tried to quantify that by doing a regression analysis between these two patterns, our calculations and their calculations, and the slope of the regression lines are given here as a function of altitude. And typically, the slope of that regression line is between two and four uh, for the momentum flux, and the same thing for the divergence of that, the so-called gravity wave drag. Again, um, a regression slope of about two to four. So roughly, they're off by a factor of two to four in their gravity wave parameterizations. Well, let's sum this up then. I've gone a little bit long, and I apologize for that. Um, the wharf accurately predicts mean leg values and temperatures and wind. The wharf captures the two deep events that we detected from airs. It gives useful predictions of mean event fluxes, but not individual leg fluxes. The ambient wind speed in the valve layer controls the um, momentum flux reaching the mid stratosphere. PV generation occurs in the valve layer, and the momentum flux launching and the gravity wave drag from WARF is significantly larger, factor of two to four larger than the MERA parameterizations. And then just to sum up my broader theme here, only satellites and constant level balloons that I know of can give any kind of broad coverage about gravity waves in the Earth's atmosphere. But both of these observe very few variables, sometimes only temperature. And none of them can resolve the kind of scales that I've been talking about here today, scales of 20 to 40 to 60, even in some cases 100 kilometers. So they're not capturing most of what I showed today. Research aircraft provide by far the most complete and detailed view of gravity wave physics, but they badly lack coverage. They just can't give us those global patterns that we really need for climate applications. With aircraft-based verification, though, numerical models might be able to fill that gap. In other words, running mesoscale models, you might be able to uh, predict these small-scale fluxes well enough to be used in climate applications. And I'll leave it there. And thanks, and sorry I went so long. Thank you very much, Ron. Do we have questions? Anything. Any? <laughs> Looks like it was almost yeah. uh, absolutely convincing. Yes. Quick question, because um, uh, you have two kinds of uh, wharf simulations, six kilometer and two kilometer, and have you ever done any comparison with your two kilometer event simulated uh, drag kind of uh, uh, quantity and with the six kilometer results? We haven't compared the two together, but I did show you diagrams comparing each with the, each with the aircraft data. Yeah, yeah. I just see but if no, the two kilometer will give you slightly more information or better, I mean. Yeah, well, we're, we're obviously going to be, we're going to be going in exactly that direction. As we try to resolve these two mysteries, the scale downscaling and the fluctuations, we're going to be looking much more in detail at those model runs.
I have one question I'd like to ask, Ron. Do you think the New Zealand site was a good substitute for the one off of uh, South America? <laughs> well, you know the history of that. Um, <laughs> Uh, I think I think it was terrific. I mean, the logistics turned out very well for New Zealand. We found lots of. Um, well, let me make one point on that, though. I'm going to go way back to that heirs evaluation. So you know, um, except for this event that occurred just as we were setting up the project, right? There was really only one deep event in deep wave. I'm not saying that's an embarrassment, but that was a little bit of a surprise, right? That um, most of deep wave did not have deep waves. If we, it, it turned out that the conditions were a little bit anomalous that year. I think we got everything we needed, by the way. I'm not being negative on this, but it turned out the conditions were a little bit anomalous in the other direction over Patagonia in that year. And we had a, a lot of deep wave events there. Now, this is 2020 hindsight, right? This is just flipping the coin. Uh, but no, I think, I think overall the project went very well, and we learned what we needed to learn. What I'd like to, if your question is, would I like to do another one in Patagonia? The answer is most definitely yes. <laughs> And so on, and so on, and so on. I know, I know. Yeah. Good. Any more questions? OK, well, let's thank you again, Ron.